All right, praise the Lord, everybody. Good afternoon. Afternoon. This is Brother Ryan from Cross Connected, and we're going to talk a little bit today about one approach, and we're going to um, go back to Numbers chapter four. We're going to look at verses thirteen through sixteen, and then we're going to finish up there this afternoon. I'm going to read a little bit, some notes I took. I'm going to read from the scriptures, some notes out of the study Bible, and I might even read a little bit of commentary this afternoon. But let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer first, all right? Heavenly Father, we just come to you right now in the name of Jesus, Lord. We just ask that you will have your way this afternoon, that you will pour out your anointing, and that you will speak through me and speak to each one of us, including myself, Lord, and apply your word to each one of our hearts and lives. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. All right, so... Numbers chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. Now, we kind of covered over the, the last couple one of these we did, uh, Victory in Jesus, kind of talked about, went over the first 12 verses. And now we're just going to pick up here, and we're going to read 13 through 16. I'm going to read 13 and 14 now. And they shall take away the ashes from the altar and spread a purple cloth thereon. Now they're talking about breaking down the tabernacle and transporting the vessels inside the tabernacle, including the Ark of the Covenant and the tabernacle. So it says here in verse 13, And they shall take away the ashes from the altar and spread a purple cloth thereon. Uh, the ashes symbolize all sin atoned, and in fact, no sin left. They were cooked down to ashes and made possible, made possible by virtue of Christ and the cross. This is what this typifies or is symbolic of, if you will. Verse 14. And they shall put upon it all the vessels thereof, wherewith they minister about it, even the censers, the flesh hooks, and the shovels, and the basins, all the vessels of the altar, and they shall spread upon it a covering of badger skins, and put to the staves of it. So, this altar they're talking about is the brazen altar on which the sacrifices were offered. Now, the badger skins were a type of the high priestly ministry of Christ. That's what they represented. So we're talking here about the brazen altar and their utensils. Uh, and the brazen altar was treated differently uh, when it was moved. Like most of the other stuff, it was covered with a blue cloth. But the brazen altar was covered with a purple cloth. And the purple cloth, it was symbolic of royalty. It typifies royalty. Um, that the one who would uh, die on the cross, is what it typifies, would be actually the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It would be Jesus Christ himself. Now, when Christ was on trial, no, when Christ was on trial, it was truly Pilate and Israel that was on trial before Christ. It really wasn't Christ on trial. And Pilate said... To Israel and to the people, behold your king. And the chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. They rejected their king is what they did. And Caesar, they rejected their king for Caesar. And Caesar has proven to be a harsh taskmaster ever since on the nation of Israel, even more so than, than Pharaoh was in their, when they was in Egyptian bondage. Um, so, it's just crazy. They, and you know, now before we get too awfully upset with Israel, we need to look at the, uh, the, the church world as well. And the church world, uh, often, places their faith in other things or adds to their faith, adds to Christ and what Christ has done. And in, and in essence, when we do that, we might not make a verbal assent to it or a mental assent to it, but what we're doing when we add to our faith or take away from what Christ has done and put our faith in something else, we are rejecting our king. That's what it comes down to. Um, now, talking about the Ark of the Covenant here a little bit, let's talk about that. 
At that time, the Ark of the Covenant was the highest manifestation of the glory of God on earth. God dwelt between the mercy seat and the cherubim, and no one could look. No one could look upon it except the high priest, and that was once a year on the great day of atonement. Now, I wanted to read something, if you will, from uh, the commentary in Numbers, uh, from page 60 of the commentary on Numbers, um, about the brazen altar and the Ark of the Covenant, and this was by Brother Swagger. And it says this, the brazen altar, which sat at the extreme eastern end of the tabernacle enclosure, even as the Ark of the Covenant sat at the western end, was the place where sin was judged. So sin was judged at the brazen altar. It typified Christ in his work as the sin bearer. It set forth the limits and extremes to which the Lord went in order to redeem fallen humanity. And yet the brazen altar was the only thing that was wrapped in royal covering, that was wrapped in the color purple. So we see in these two sacred vessels that the Ark of the Covenant conducts us to the very highest point as it regards heaven, while the brazen altar takes us to the lowest point on earth, the place where the entirety of the sin penalty for mankind was loaded upon him, was loaded upon Christ. In all these things, we see Christ, but in different aspects of his life and ministry. Okay. Now I want to read verses 15 and 16, Numbers 4, 15 and 16. And when Aaron and his sons have made an end of covering the sanctuary and all the vessels of the sanctuary, as the camp is set to, is set forward, after that the sons of Kohath shall come to bear it, but they shall not touch any holy thing lest they die. These things are the burdens of the son of Kohath in the tabernacle of the congregation. Now let me read the expositor study note here in my study Bible. I think this is very good. After the priest had prepared all the sacred vessels for transportation, then and only then to, could the Kohathites come in to take them away. They were not for a moment to go in and look upon the holy things, lest they die. Concerning this, William says, Concerning this, William says, When God dwells in power in the camp, it is as when a wire is charged with electricity. Hence, when he withdrew, men could look on and handle those holy things with impunity. The carnal curiosity which would... Analyze Christ's human nature brings death unto the soul. Now going on to verse 16. And to the opposite, Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, pertains the oil for the light and the sweet incense and the daily meat offerings and the anointing oil and the oversight of all the tabernacle and of all that all that therein is in the sanctuary and in the vessels thereof. Now, Eliezer, he was the son of Aaron, and he was in charge of the Kohathites. Now, going back to my notes, the priest followed the details. The priest followed the details that the Lord had given Moses, and he, they followed them to a love, to the letter, properly covering the vessels. Then the Kohathites, uh, the Kohathites would transport them according to the Lord's instructions. And they were not to lift the coverings and look at the vessels or touch the vessels or the altar or the Ark of the Covenant, uh, lest they should die. Now all this, all this shows us that Christ can only be approached one way. By faith in what he's done at Calvary's cross is what this all points to. Now let's look at Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. We'll give you some Old Covenant, Old Testament. Now we're going to go to the New Covenant, New Testament. And we're going to go to the Pauline epistles here. Galatians 5, verses 1 through 10. And we won't be much longer, so please bear with me. Galatians 5, 1 through 10. 
And it says this, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. Christ has given us liberty to live free from the law, to live free from the rule and reign and sin. Christ has done that. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. But here, really, more importantly, the bondage of the law. Bondage of sin, yes, and bondage of the law. Which, if we get entangled to the yoke of the law, bondage of the law, we're back in sin anyway. The sin nature rises up again. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man who is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. And here they were getting circumcised to follow the law. They weren't getting circumcised like they do today for medical reasons. It was to follow the, the, the laws of Judaism. And it's verse 4 says, Christ has become no effect unto you. He's become powerless unto you. He he's not working in you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law or seek to be justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. If we place our faith in what we do, even if it's in good things, mind you, things that we should do, our spiritual disciplines, we should do them. What do I mean by our spiritual disciplines? We should read our Bibles. We should, we should pray. Uh, we should fast. Um, we should give and we should witness. We should do good works. But if we put our faith in those things, if we put our faith in those things and not in Christ alone and what Christ has done alone, we are falling from grace. For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For we, through the Spirit, through the Holy Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which works by love. You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Who sh who got you to place your faith in works or good deeds or whatever it is? Who, who had you move your faith from Christ and what Christ did alone at the cross? Who did that to you? Who did hinder you? The persuasion comes not of him. The him here is the Holy Spirit. The persuasion comes not of him who calls you a little leaven, a little corruption, a little yeast, leaveneth the whole lump, corrupts the whole lump. A little leaven in our doctrine, a little leaven in our faith, corrupts the whole thing. If we don't get Christ right, and our faith is in Christ alone, and what Christ has done at Calvary, then the whole thing is wrong. Somehow, some form or fashion, what we're believing in is wrong, and, and, and we, we might be saved because we might sincerely be, be believing in Christ for salvation, but we will not know how to walk in victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil. We will not know how to walk after the Spirit or in the Spirit. What God's prescribed order of victory is if we get Christ wrong. Our Christian walk will be up and down, up and down. Uh, it'll be like a roller coaster. Uh, the only thing, the greatest difference is we'll be saved, but we won't be walking in that victory that we should be walking in. And there's one way to walk in that victory, and that's by faith in Christ alone and what Christ has done, which gives the Holy Spirit the power to do what only he can do in us and through us. Verse 10, last verse here, and I'm going to read one other thing, I think, from the commentary. I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded, but he who trouble you troubles you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. Now, in the New Covenant, it tells us about Satan having his own ministers in churches posing as ministers of light and righteousness 
uh, standing behind pulpits, that these people are demonically uh, oppressed or they're demonically possessed. It could be one or the other, but spreading lies and false doctrine to lead people astray to destroy souls. And, and it's very seldom brought up in in churches anymore. We um, and it's to the hurt, it's to the hurt of the body of Christ that this isn't taught, that this isn't brought up, that this is not expounded on. Um, and we have many people who are walking not in more abundant life, but. They're walking in a life where there's a constant failure of some sort spiritually. Now let me read this. While we certainly aren't under the law any longer, still if Christ is approached in the wrong way, which refers to a way other than the cross and speaks of his shed blood, spiritual death will definitely be the result. We should study the analogy very keenly because to be sure it applies presently as well. As Israel ultimately forgot the holiness of God, I am fr afraid that we in the modern church are doing the same. We praise the Lord the all too often from the position of something other than the cross. Consequently, it's praise that God will not accept. We make everything the object of our faith instead of the right thing which is the cross of Christ, and then boast of our great faith with God, concluding us as having no faith at all. That's the reason these Old Testament types should be studied ardently and minutely. In symbolic form, they proclaim to us the spiritual, which should be a great lesson to us, and in fact is are meant to be a great lesson to us. Paul said, Now all these things happen unto them for examples, as a warning we sh that we should, we had best heed these warnings. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him who thinks he stands and this is, he's writing this to all believers. Wherefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Now this means not merely fall from fellowship as some teach, but to fall from eternal salvation. Now this won't happen if the cross is ever in view. If, if, if our faith is in Christ alone and what Christ has done and we've been born again and it's here. And not just up here, not just a mental ascent, if you will, not just a prayer. And if sin don't, you know, we will fall as believers. Even if our faith is right, we will struggle at times. But we will hate to fail the Lord. We will cry out to the Lord in forgiveness and repentance and ask him to change us and to continue to work in, in our lives. And... If you don't hate sin, you need to go to the Lord and have him check you out, give you a spiritual checkup. But there's one way to approach God the Father and Jesus Christ, and it is coming through the cross, coming through the Son. And, and there's one approach to be right, one way to deal with sin, one way to receive the blessings of God, including the mighty baptism and infilling of the Holy Spirit. And... That is by faith in Christ and what Christ alone has done. Thank you. God bless you for tuning in. We love you here at Cross Connected. But more importantly, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit love you. Amen. Thank you for tuning in and commenting.